Hello to everybody watching. Uh, I'm very excited to greet Hanura and Yemi. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. My pleasure. Greetings from here. Bucharest, Romania, in this very uh, weird year still, mm -hmm. the second of the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, this is an inclusive interview for our community Armada, uh, for our readers of science fiction, fantasy, and thriller. Uh, we published a couple of weeks ago, Summerland, your latest novel. So I wanted to make um, like a short introduction to our readers who mostly know you from the Quantum Fifth Trilogy, which we published a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a very new and original standalone novel because it has so many layers. Uh, it's an alternate history. So at the turning of the 20th century, it's an espionage thriller, but it's also written in a very noir and grim style all revolving around the very original idea of the afterlife, which is not only discovered, but also colonized by the living. Um, so I guess my first question uh, would be, how was to make the leap from something as futuristic as the quantum fifth uh, to this very particular setting of Summerland? Um, that's a great question. Uh, so I, I, I don't think it was, uh, in terms of the process, uh, I don't think it was a massive leap. So both uh, both works involves a lot of world building and and and, and obviously uh, trying to create compelling characters. And uh, there were um, in, in both cases you kind of had had certain basic assumptions of the setting and then then trying to to build the world around that. Um, I think the the two main differences were that. Um, it was actually possible to do uh, more research um, in, in terms of both in terms of like actual locations and history and, and then then also spycraft. So so I was I was able to talk to a former CIA uh, uh, operative who, who shared some of the uh, tradecraft points around how, how do you actually cultivate an asset and how do you how do you win their their trust and, and, and so on. Uh, and then, you know, a lot of the locations in London, I was able to visit and, and uh, uh, actually, actually physically see them. And then, of course, there was a, there was a wealth of uh, historical uh, information about uh, 1930s and uh, a lot of the historical characters that uh, appear in the book. Um, that was actually a little challenging at first because I, 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 uh, I almost went down into this um, obsessive research rabbit hole of trying to really, can I, can I, uh, can I, uh, um, get everything right about the, the real historical figures that appear there. Uh, but then I realized that a trick that historical novelists often use uh, to have a bit more freedom is uh, they actually create characters who are uh, inspired by real historical figures, but not identical. So, so, so that was kind of quite a, quite an empowering realization that you, you can actually make things up still in, in the context of a context of a historical uh, setting, um, but yeah, I, I would say those those were the two two main differences. But uh, apart from that, I think the writing process was was the same. And uh, um, and I kind of I, I think for me, like there there wasn't much of a conceptual difference between speculating about uh, things rooted in in real life physics and uh, real life uh, um, computer science to to speculating based on imaginary science, and uh, and actually. Um, one of the things that really drew me uh, to this set of ideas was that uh, in 19th century physics, there was no difference between the supernatural and, and uh, the, the physical world. So, so the same people who were uh, busy creating theory of electromagnetism or inventing, inventing the radio or, or, or uh, um, what have you, were also very uh, keen uh, keenly speculating about uh, what the afterlife might be like, what what kind of scientific explanations could we have for the afterlife, and uh, um, there was just so many things happening in the world at the time that it didn't seem so strange to think that maybe we could contact the afterlife. So um, anyway, anyway, that's a, a long, longish, longish answer. But uh, so so there were so, certainly similarities, but maybe the the kind of historical. Uh, Historical elements were, were were probably the main difference and how that affected uh, the research process. Mm -hmm. um, what you were saying brought to mind that famous line that uh, science is sometimes magic we haven't understood yet. Yes, ab oh. absolutely. Um, yeah. Or or any sufficiently advanced uh, science is indistinguishable uh, technology is indistinguishable from from magic that's, yeah. that's right yeah um, um i was talking recently to mary robinette kowal about her um, lady astronaut series and about mm. how 
to do research for something that starts as a historical novel, but then alternates history. And she said that um, there is this danger to do too much research and to try to get everything right, but you have just have to understand that you have to get some things right, like the characters and some, some points of the setting. Um, but in this novel, like I said, the revolving, I mean, the main character, let's say, is the afterlife, which is something that has challenged as you as well said, imagination since forever. Um, but it usually revolves around questions of um, spirituality and the soul and identity. And um, these are here in your novel as well. So how do they uh, resolve for the people living in a world where the afterlife is colonized? What is the soul? What is identity anymore? Yeah, obviously, obviously identity is something Thing that is uh, very important for uh, a spy novel. I mean, uh, so so when uh, when you're a spy, you do construct uh, carefully layered layered identities and can easily get lost in lost in the false ones. Um, so so that's obviously a very uh, classic uh, spy spy story trope. Um, and um, I guess yeah. So so the. Um, um, question of identity in, in the book we also sort of comes from uh, exploration of a, a position of a woman in, in a very very patriarchal uh, setting uh, so Rachel kind of goes through this this struggle with uh, uh, with the um, uh, with her her very masculine uh, spy environment and then uh, I guess for the other main character Peter it's it's it, it, re it really is about that uh, looking for something true like looking looking for something that is uh, um, uh, unshakable, shakable that, that you can kind of build your identity or or, or um, world worldview around, and uh, and in his case, he's been sort of for various reasons in the book lie, lied to about certain things from from early childhood. So so he, he's really compelled to look for that, and and I guess that the in a way the metaphysical twist in Summerland is that um, you know th that the afterlife is not the source of the ultimate truth like it's it's just another setting for for the games that we we play with with truths and lies and lies and identities and and sort of ultimately we we kind of have to have to find that that seek that meaning the true source of meaning and, and purpose uh in in something else and then the characters try to find that uh in different ways and and succeed or fail um but um but yeah so so in a, in a way like like um the the realm of the transcendent uh the, the, the afterlife uh, becomes sort of mundane. I mean, it's it it, it is it is obviously like complex and uh, uh, and there are there are some whiz bang <laughs> things that happen there, uh, but it's not mystical. Mm -hmm. um, so so it, it is actually something that uh, has uh, by is seen by the British Empire almost as, as as a new frontier for colonialism. Like like this is this, this is new territory that can be claimed and and, and exploited and and uh, used technologically. So, so then, uh, you know, that, that be, in, in a world like that, what then is transcendent? What, what is sort of, the, where, where do you find the, the spiritual meaning? Uh, and uh, yeah, um, that's sort of, I think the novel doesn't answer that, but tries to at least uh, ask that question. It shows people that are trying to answer that, yes. Um, it is a bit pessimistic maybe that even in the afterlife, um, humanity sort of makes the same mistakes and uh, the historic the same historical mistakes because um there are a lot of political plays uh in the novel like um the spanish civil war comes to play the menacing uh, rise of the soviet union um why did you choose russia as the main uh, villain is it just because it's a are there villains pope? are there yes, are, they, are, are there villain. are there villains <laughs> <laughs> uh so um so actually, uh, I don't think it was necessary. So, so you know that that's that's a debatable question whether whether there are there are villains villains in the book uh, or not. But um, the um, uh, but at least the main main antagonists. So um, I mean, I think the the um, that came actually more from um, so so there were um, kind of two threads of historical facts or his, interesting sort of historical threads that I wanted to uh, include in the book. And one was this fascination that the uh, uh, British upper class and, and the, the kind of British uh, scientific and intelli kind of uh, intelligentsia uh, elite 
uh, had with the afterlife in the late 19th and early 20th century. So, so that was uh, uh, one thread. But then at the same time, there was also um, some very interesting thinking going on in the early Soviet Union. And uh, one of the um, uh, groups that um, is kind of talked about in Summerland, but which was a real, real group of people are the God builders mm -hmm. who um, <clears throat> sort of, uh, so people like Krasin and, and uh, some of the early, er, other early revolutionaries, <clears throat> they um, concluded that this new Soviet Union was going to need a religion. Um, and um, uh, therefore they, they, they set out to create one. And the idea was that Lenin would become sort of the, the uh, main divine entity in this, in this new religion. And in, in real life, sort of Stalin interviewed, in, in, intervened and that, that didn't really play out, but they really were planning to, to have this bizarre monument uh, around Lenin's tomb, which would be modeled after uh, a hypercube. <laughs> uh, there was this abstract Russian artist who was uh, commissioned to come up with some designs. So, so there's that four dimensional connection there, there as well. Um, and then um, the, 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 the kind of uh, idea was that every Soviet home would have a replica, little replica of Lenin's tomb as a sort of little altar of worship. And uh, so both those ideas just seemed so weird that they, they kind of had to be, I, I had to fit them in, in somehow. And, and, uh, and there was also like a very interesting tension between those two societies and how they would approach the afterlife. So, so, so the British afterlife is, is this kind of uh, upper class thing almost, or, or like, like a place where, where you have to, where there's where still hierarchy. Uh, and where, whereas uh, the Soviet afterlife becomes like this godhead who absorbs uh, everything uh, in, into it. So, so yeah, so, so I think that that felt like a natural juxtaposition of the two. And, and, uh, and then, you know, there was also an aspect of playing out uh, some of these alternate histories. So uh, in, in, a world, in a world where um, the British Empire actually has, has early access to all this cool technology, and retains its power and position of importance in the world longer uh, than it did in, in, in uh, sort of our, our version of the history, uh, then probably, you know, uh, Germany is not going to be the, the main antagonist because that's going to, they're, they're going to get crushed in more, even, even more than they did in, in uh, World War I. And then that, that sort of leaves the US and the, the, the Soviet Union as the, the, the antagonists and philosophically the Soviets seemed, seemed more more interesting and obviously also like a, uh, a classical, class, classic kind of kind of uh, antagonist in spy stories. Mm -hmm. uh, Rachel White uh, is a very fiery character and she has a very witty voice, um, but she's also very likable, of course, not in the manner of, I don't know, the girl next door, but in terms of mm -hmm. a charming leading lady. Uh, what was the inspiration for her? Uh, so there is a um, real life historical character who uh, is a direct inspiration. So uh, the, the first, uh, first MI, uh, MI5, MI6 uh, officer uh, who, who kind of has, is not identical to Rachel, but, but sort of has, has a, lot of, a lot of biographical similarities. And uh, so I kind of, kind of randomly came across her um, in, in one of the um, um, kind of primary uh, research sources I, I was using and um, she was kind of kind of like a she was actually it's interesting actually in the um, in the book this was this is a book about Kim Philby she was almost like a side note sidebar character in the, in the story of Kim Philby the one of the ma major uh, uh, Soviet moles uh, in the uh, British intelligence service um, and um, uh, and, and I just kind of became fascinated by her and started thinking about what, what, what would it actually have been like to be like the first, first female uh, MI5 officer who, who actually uh, uh, ended up being in real life also quite, quite successful. Um, but like what an enormous struggle uh, it must have been and what, what sort of character and personality would, would, would you have to have to, to be able to go through that. So, so yeah, um, there was definitely a direct uh, mm -hmm. inspiration there. Um, so for every speculative fiction, uh, the science of it has to be really coherent down to every detail. Uh, and since you have such an original premise here and also the historical reference references, I wondered who you gave your final drafts to read 
did you give them to an innocent eye, let's say, who should just enjoy the story, or maybe you shared it with some fellow scientists just to check if everything is coherent to the end with the science? Um, so I, I guess in this case, it was more about internal consistency, like whether the internal logic held up rather than whether the, the actual actual facts were right. But um, the um, uh, my, my um, uh, you know, I have a, a circle of writer friends who, 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 who I shared it with uh, yeah, here in the Bay Area and also a couple of people in the UK who, who gave some great, great feedback. And then uh, my editor, uh, also called Rachel, by the way, the way had had a Rachel Winterbottom had a had a, a big role in um, uh, obviously in shaping the book. Uh, and then my my um, uh, copy editor actually did an amazing amount of fact checking. Mm -hmm. So she she uh, she did things like uh, you know uh, the timings of uh, travel within London, like like does it does it how long does it take to walk from this street to this street? Like does that actually match up or, or like this model of a typewriter did not, did, was not available in, in like uh, 19, uh, 1938 and, and, and so on. So, so, so not the science, but like, like the, those, those kinds of little details uh, definitely helped. Um, there was a, um, so uh, I think I, I acknowledge um, a um, British researcher who's uh, done a lot of work uh, on um, the, the history of four dimensions in uh, in the um, um, kind of British uh, uh, ideological evol evolution and, and of, of science and philosophy uh, who, who gave quite a lot of uh, input on on uh, getting all the details right about uh, uh, Hinton, James Hinton, whose uh, ideas play quite a big role. So, but yeah, uh, primarily like uh, close writer friends. Our readers are always interested in, in the um, writing process and the question I hear a lot from them for our authors is um, which takes longer and why uh, is it the creative drafting process or the editing afterwards in the case of Summerland how was it. Um, I think it, it was probably the editing. I mean, the uh, it, it is it is a little different for um, for each book. Uh, Summerland was was quite a uh, challenging book to write. So I actually did write uh, an entire draft, which then uh, I rewrote completely, which changed quite a bit. Um, but for me, typically there is this. Um, you can kind of kind of divide it into three three stages. There's this quite long research and thinking and outlining and kind of noodling process that that can uh, take quite a while sometimes more than a year and then then there's there's a, a short intense period of writing the first draft and then again like a longer longer period of editing so uh, yeah probably in this case there, there was the, the editing editing part and rewriting took longer so um, how was last year for you in for you as a writer because some of us had maybe, a lot of time on our hands. Some of us well, were stuck at home. Uh, some people found found the time to write the books they didn't have time to write until then. How was it for you last year? Um, so for me, it's been a little strange because uh, uh, so uh, I'm of course also a CEO of a biotech startup, and um, so uh, one year ago, uh, back in March 2020, we already got worried about the emergence of variants. Uh, so uh, the possibility of the coronavirus mutating. So so we started, we raised some some money to to develop a uh, mutation resistant coronavirus vaccine, which which is what we've been working on for the last twelve months. So that has entirely consumed my time, like hundred um, percent. And uh, the the um, you know that's that's ongoing work, and we're we're pretty confident that we'll we'll actually have uh, a pretty powerful next wave or the second wave vaccine candidate that. Will will work not just against the current variants but also for against future ones. Um, so so that's been that's been quite intense. Uh, it's been uh, it's been I, I guess the positive side of it is that it's it's felt quite quite empowering to to be able to 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 work work on uh, something that actually impacts or can impact the course of the course of the pandemic. Um, so even even psychologically, even if it ends up not being needed, it's been it's been useful. Um, it has so so in terms of how that that has affected writing, like like time wise, it certainly certainly has eliminated a lot of a lot of uh, most of my writing time. But um, so I was working on uh, a uh, near future uh, kind of biotech themed novel before the pandemic, and um, 
a lot of the themes uh, the, that uh, where that that book was was trying to to explore suddenly ceased to be relevant. So so they they actually that that uh, it's it's kind of one 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 of the things that the pandemic has done overall. I think it's rewritten our our idea of what the future is like. Uh, it's in 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 many many ways. And um, so so I, I've kind of the the time I've had had to spend on writing. I've I've tried to kind of rework the idea of what that novel actually is now about and what 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 this new future that the pandemic has created looks like and and I'm I'm starting to to actually now now get there to 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 have a clear clear idea of uh, what what the sort of future of biotechnology near term is is going to look like and 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 how that affects our or, or again questions around identity and and uh, our relationships with each, with each other um and, and then uh, I, I did, did make one conscious effort to write a very optimistic uh, post-pandemic story, which, uh, uh, which was also, also helpful. So it's just, just a short story called Vaccine Season, which is uh, coming out soon in a uh, MIT Technology Review uh, collection. Um, and, uh, and actually will also be read by LeVar Burton on his, on his podcast quite soon. So, so uh, quite excited about that. Um, but, um, but yeah, uh, it's so, so I'm kind of hoping that as we, as we get our vaccine candidate going, going forward, well, I'll have a little more time, time to write. And then, um, uh, it's really been interesting to think about what does this mean? Like, what, what does our future look like now? What, what kinds of futures, what kind of range of futures is possible and, and what are the important questions to, to explore? So, um, so yeah, uh, it's been an interesting year. Um, that leads directly into the final request I had for you, which was um, uh, for you to give us one prediction about the near future um, in terms of biotechnology, in terms of health, in terms of, I don't know, whatever, whatever you feel like could be a, a legit prediction about the near future for, for everyone. Hmm. So... So I think that's uh, that's a really really good question. So I think um, maybe like to 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 try to um, discern some kind of overall trend. So mm -hmm. the most advanced technologies in 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 biotech, uh, things like CAR T cell therapies, where you take somebody's immune cells and you 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 engineer them and you put them back in to to attack a tumor. Or, or gene therapies where you use a virus to deliver a gene to, to, to a patient's, patient's body to, to maybe repair a gene that they're, they're missing, or, or mRNA, which is uh, where, where, you, where you actually like use, the, use this more transient form of genetic information to, to produce uh, like a bit of a virus to work as a vaccine or, 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 or a biological drug. All these things were, were there uh, before the pandemic, but the thinking was that these new modalities and these new technologies are going to be primarily deployed um, for a very small number of patients. So we're, we're going to treat rare advanced cancers, we're going to treat rare genetic diseases. These are, these are going to be very expensive therapies. They're going to cost uh, you know, up to a million dollars uh, for, for some of the gene therapies. Um, so, so they're going to be, they're, they're, the, the most advanced biotechnologies are going to be available only to a very small fraction of the population. Now, what's very interesting about the, the coronavirus vaccines that we're deploying now is that they are based on these technologies. So, uh, so, so there's MR, obviously the leading vaccines are mRNA, uh, AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson are using an adenoviral vector, which is also a gene therapy vector. And we now have manufacturing capacity to, to produce uh, billions of doses of these things. Uh, so effectively, we are, uh, just this year alone, treating billions of people with gene therapy. Um, so I think that trend uh, will persist. So there's this reversal of thinking about these new technologies, not just for a very small fraction of the population, but actually for everybody. And, uh, the, and I think we are still extremely early in terms of how we, how we utilize these technologies. So, um, so, so, so I think like we will have some kind of iPhone for the immune system, some, some kind of, some kind of uh, way to, to reprogram and control the immune system that everybody will have access to, that will have, have impact 
on protecting us from future pandemics and and also for perhaps perhaps uh, preventing preventing cancers and and other other diseases. So so I think like that. But but yeah, I think my my kind of key prediction would be that mindset shift from new technologies for a small number of patients to new technologies for everybody. Mm -hmm. So that's a sort of optimistic view because it speeds things up and with a much higher range of people. Absolutely. Well, no, I mean, I mean, if, if you think about it, it is completely crazy. Like, like mRNA was a year ago still, like this experimental new thing. Uh, most vaccine experts thought it, it's not going to work. The, the, the re actual vaccine, powerful vaccines were going to be the traditional vaccine platforms. Uh, you know, and now we've vaccinated hundreds of millions of people and they're, and, and, and they're very, very effective. So, so I think like, again, like the, the and this is, uh, I, I think the mindset of recognizing that the world can change very suddenly mm -hmm. is something that, that science fiction fans and, and fantasy fans kind of uh, have internalized. And, and now we are really uh, having to deal with this sudden catacly cataclysmic change. And I think the optimistic, optimistic implication of that is that change is possible. Like now, now, now that um, it's kind of old fashioned biotech future or, or you know, any, 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 uh, any, any kind of future uh, has been erased. We have the freedom to, to rewrite the future to be what we want. Uh, and, uh, and there is this sort of moment, I think, where we have a lot of leverage to build uh, a better, better future. That's, uh, that sounds great. We just have to uh, pass from this current crisis and look forward to yep. the future without any menace from any virus just to better things. Mm -hmm. Thank you so yep. much. No, I think it, you know, it's, uh, thank you. No, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be hard for sure for, for some time. Uh, and, uh, and I think, um, again, again, I think, uh, one of maybe one of the things that has, um, also struck home for me is that, um, everybody's actions in the pandemic have exponential consequences. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, so I kind of, you know, I, I felt better about the situation when I was able to, to, to work with my team on a vaccine. But uh, actually, every single individual can make an impact to make this transition period easier. So by, you know, by wearing a mask, getting vaccinated, by social, social distancing, like doing all the little things, because they will, they will actually have a uh, vast, vast impact mm -hmm. um, because of the way the virus, virus works and amplifies everything we do. So individual responsibility for, not for just oneself, but for everybody. Exactly, yeah. Thank you so much for, and now after you told us what you're working on, I feel almost guilty that I kept you for 15 minutes for this interview. No, no, that's okay, that's okay. So um, not all heroes wear capes. Some of them also write books. <laughs> so please, uh, please, uh, please read uh, and discover Summerland and uh, follow Hanuraniemi on Twitter for more news. Thank you so much. Thank you.